Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mary Peterson. I lead the marketing team here at Cambium Networks, and I'm joined by Forrest James, who's a co-founder of Enertribe, um, a networking service provider company focused on tribal areas and other um, networking opportunities. So today what we're going to do is have an informal discussion and hopefully um, answer some questions from the audience as we go. So I'd like to just open with a couple comments and then we'll um, dive right in. So as we all know, connectivity is a lifeline now more than ever. It's I'm more and more I hear people every day referring to it like a utility. It's no different than water and electricity. It's essential to our daily lives. And everyone in our industry is focused on expanding and improving network access around the world as rapidly and effectively as possible. So in that context, I'd like to start today by congratulating you, Forrest, and your team at Enterprise for receiving the Cambium Network's Wireless Connectivity Hero Award that recognizes all the hard work you and your team have been doing over the last, well, especially over the last eight to nine months in supporting deployment of broadband internet access to Native American communities. The potential benefit is huge. Well, thank you for having us. We sure appreciate it. My team and I are grateful. Yeah, it's great, great work that you guys are doing. Forrest, you could start by just giving us an overview of what, who's Enertribe Enter and what do you guys do and maybe little highlights of some recent projects. Sure, no problem. Well, Delaha, Chotage ne Nusling. Good morning and thank you for having us, Mary. I appreciate it. Olivia as well. Uh, my name is Forrest James. I am the CEO of Intertribe. Uh, I'm also a citizen of the Talawadani Nation. Our tribal lands actually straddle the Oregon and California coastal border, a uh, beautiful country where the redwoods meet the ocean. Uh, but Intertribe is a Native American and woman-owned company. It's actually one of three Native and woman-owned firms that uh, specialize in indigenous uh, economic development, indigenous broadband. So we got our start, Intertribe got its start within Indian country. So we represent tribal governments and tribal business and their efforts to uh, plan, fund, and build fiber optic and wireless infrastructure. Uh, most of the tribes that we serve have very little uh, to no broadband in most cases. Some, in some cases, we're coming right on the back end of, of power. But Intertribe serves as a different resource for different groups. For instance, state and federal agencies utilize us to help stabilize their infrastructure projects that are funded by state and federal grants, for instance. Uh, we have a grant services department. Uh, Ron Flavin is an Apache native and he's helped us bring in over $250 million in infrastructure funding over the last 12 years or so. Uh, and then for telephone companies, we're used for Section 106, cultural environmental work and other things. Uh, our primary focus, though, has been indigenous communities. So we spend a great deal of time helping tribes uh, plan, fund, and build those infrastructure projects. That's the short version. <laughs> oh, okay, that's great. So, so Forrest, you know, inter internet connectivity is not a new issue in tribal communities, right? I mean, it's been there for a long time. So. What do you think the things are that that's changed now that we're able to to bring internet to more people and help close the digital divide gap, which has gotten worse, of course, because of of the COVID situation? Sure. Um, well, I would say that there's no silver bullet per se that's that's um, made that happen. I'd say it's an effort of many different agencies, funding mechanisms, spectrum. For instance, I'll, I'll bring you back 10 years ago, sitting in Wisconsin at the Lac de Flambeau uh, Ojibwe Tribes Council meeting. And a woman stands up and she says, uh, I would like to see the FCC acknowledge spectrum as a natural resource for indigenous communities. FCC representative was there and said, uh, that'll be in 30 years. To me, the first <laughs> example of that happening was the educational broadcast spectrum in the tribal priority window. So EBS, uh, was sort of a catalyst. It's important to understand that, um, I mean, tribes are made of communities and our tribal governments are simply um, wearing many hats most of the time. So it might be the broadband, the IT department that's tasked with solving the digital divide for a community. It might be the planning department 
um, mm -hmm. it might be a tribal council member. But in all those cases, it's really a matter of raising awareness. The educational broadcast spectrum started the conversations and helped a lot of our communities start asking questions and what does it mean to treat spectrum as a natural resource? That's one. So EBS was a, a pretty good catalyst after years of, of cultivation. Um, other than that, there's a lot of, of course, step, state and federal funding. Uh, you've got the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which is bleeding out into indigenous communities. Our hope is that the providers work uh, cooperatively with the indigenous communities that they're passing through and find ways to sort of partner, partner with them. Because we're seeing more and more tribes um, exercise their sovereignty, self-determination through communications. So yeah. in many cases, what it takes to do that is the partnerships with uh, with the providers. Uh, there's other methods that have helped do that. If you'll notice that uh, uh, with little planning, uh, you can end up with a, a very difficult project. So planning is essential for uh, for tribes. And there are federal agencies and state agencies that put up dollars to help make that planning successful. Get your engineering done in advance, then go after your infrastructure funding. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I would summarize just by saying spectrum, grants, and other forms of partnerships are really what are helping bandage the digital divide. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, at Camden, we recognize spectrum as a scarce natural resource for everybody around the world, right? Especially now. So it is, it is, and we need to treat it as such and use it as much as we can So um, to help bring connectivity. So on the the various government funding fronts are, are have the tribes pretty much all um as you can see applied for these funds are they actively applying for them or what's the status of of that right now i'm not that familiar with it so it's not a yes or no i would say that if you just take the tribal priority window with the fcc for ebs uh, 214 tribes successfully applied for and and the fcc accepted their applications for ebs now that's not funding but that does launch into other discussions that can help generate funding um okay. most recently what's that i said okay that's yeah okay great now, most recently, though, the, the federal government launched the CARES Act, um, and that has thrown every one of our clients, past and future, into kind of a hyperspeed mode, prioritizing with very little time to spend a certain amount of money um, and prioritize it for their community. Broadband has come to the forefront in, in many of those cases. So CARES Act, while beneficial and has helped accomplish a lot in a very little amount of time, has also helped create a lot of questions, all the questions that should be answered. There are tribes across the country that are making use of the USDA's technical assistance funding through the Rural Utility Service. They're taking advantage of reconnect and community connect funding under our US as well. So technical assistance being your planning, uh, uh, reconnect being your infrastructure. Then you've got wow. some that go to the Economic Development Agency for their planning grants. Um, the interesting thing about when you start looking at economic development and tribes when we're talking about broadband is broadband is the common thread that weaves its way through every single department throughout an indigenous government and throughout the business side of it. So what you've got are these tribes that uh, have completed what's called their SEDS plan, their comprehensive economic development strategy that, that highlights that thread. And suddenly, once that is in place, funding for any infrastructure project that gets taken to a whole new level because then you have things like e-rate distance learning you've got all these different funding mechanisms that all of a sudden can patch together quite well whereas prior to that planning everybody may have been working in silos does that answer your question yeah it does yeah it sounds like there's a lot of resources out there um to support these activities it also sounds like it's a some effort to get it sort it all out but if you it do is, in fact, it's a lot of some people think that grants are free money they are not in fact in many cases they're quite expensive right. um, but there's other methods so we also spend a great deal of time where uh, cell phone companies telephone broadband fiber companies say hey we know we want to work with the tribe we're not sure how they have a wisp or they want a wisp what do we do and right. what we've found is there are those public private partnerships that are uh, that if done right can be extremely beneficial. We're seeing more and more in the state of California, the Public Utility Commission is encouraging under CASA mm -hmm. funds 
for the providers to provide IOUs, indefeasible right of use uh, for say two pairs to the local indigenous community. And it's making a shift in how many broadband companies do business, but for the better, I actually believe it's uh, equally profitable if done right. Okay, that sounds great. So can you tell us about one of your projects that you recently did and sort of how you got it going and what the role was of Entertribe and of course, what the results been so far? Oh, sure. So I should clarify that uh, Entertribe has worked throughout North America with First Nations and tribes. So we've worked as far east as the Seminole Tribe in Florida, to the Lacta Flambeau in Wisconsin, to the Katlodeci up in the Arctic Circle, Colville Tribes, California Tribes, there's 111 of them. So there's, there's tribes all over the place that we have worked with or are working with. All of those projects are in different phases of planning, funding, building. Uh, the building is, of course, where the most fun is at because we're seeing results. Um, I firsthand seen a resident who would commute two, three hours a day to do remote school from a small town. She would have to hire a babysitter. She'd lose six, you know, six hours a day, really, with her kids. Suddenly, the day that internet was brought into that community, she had six extra hours with her kids. Uh, so I've seen the impact of when we actually get to the infrastructure part. Uh, Intertribe comes in to help with project management, grant and program management. So how do we roll this out with the federal or state agency? Environmental permitting, Section 106 cultural. We work with the TIPO and the SHPO offices to help permit fiber, wireless towers, that kind of stuff. Uh, we've also had the privilege of building the towers, communications huts. Uh, we do all the wireless engineering and installation for our customers. Uh, a good example might be, let's see, the Karuk tribe. The Karuk tribe is a small tribe in Northern California. They are located, uh, the center of their world is, is or Orleans, California, actually, but the headquarters is in Happy Camp. Uh, Orleans today still has no cell phone service. Uh, we had the privilege of starting to work with that tribe some time ago, and we're able to bring six miles of fiber optics from a Siskutel interconnect into Orleans and then distribute it via a WISP. So even today, the only means for communications for the most part that's reliable that they have is is this network. Um, what we went ahead and did is we want you to picture a parallel project like that happening with the Yurok tribe just out to the west. The Yurok tribe has their own WISP as well and like you know many tribes both of these projects were grant funded with the USDA most recently with the California Advanced Services Fund. And we were brought in to sort of help bring a bigger joint project together with 104 miles of fiber optics. We've spent the last uh, four years actually permitting that. We've got over 16 different agencies, 25 miles of national parks. So if you can imagine, it's lovely paperwork that would put many people. <laughs> four years just to get the permits? That's before you started digging or hanging? Yes. Yeah, now part of it, it's important to note, and this it is really important to note that when you work in California, there's what's called the California Environmental Quality Act. So we spent that first three years building a what's called a proponents environmental assessment. It's it's really a process you have to make it through with the state and a third party contractor that says every inch of your projects considers all the cultural and environmental ramifications. Um, we're in that review right now, but- um, Wow. I guess I would say that uh, in every tribal infrastructure project that we've worked on is different. Many of them are not a, it is an EBS network, it is a fiber network, it is a WISP. It's usually a combination because it's people trying to solve problems, right? Local communities trying to pitch in and so on. Um, we've seen the growth of the economic health of a community uh, significantly increase. So we help tribes carry out those SEDS plans, which means what are we doing for the next five years as a total community with the state and federal around us and other communities. And what we found is indigenous and rural communities alike are actually, they're satisfied with an endeavor, an infrastructure project, if it brings that economic health in. Now with yeah. rural communities, it's not usually a cash cow to have a wisp or a fiber to the home play. It's, it's a, mm -hmm. just like water. It's mm -hmm. extremely valuable for what you use it for more than getting it in, right? So Absolutely. suddenly water is incredibly important to get when you're in the desert, but how you use it is where all the real, that application comes. We've seen a lot of that growth um, firsthand with tribes. The difficulty comes, for instance, with the, the Klamath River Rural Broadband Initiative. 
you got to picture two linear tribal governments working with a state government, matched by federal government. So obviously, again, grants aren't free. Um, it takes a little bit of work. In other cases, though, so for instance, let's move over to the Wyoming. You've got the Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone tribe. They become an eligible telecommunications carrier. They've applied for EPS. They've got a WISP of about a thousand customers, fiber to the home. They got CAF funding last year. Um, but you've got a local telephone company that has a kind of a mutual interest and together they're building out infrastructure uh, on the reservation. So that's less just grants and actually a mix of private capital, which I think uh, speeds things up. If you ever tried to operate a broadband company at the speed of policy, it's doable, it's just really painful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it reminds me of the E-rate world in education. Some schools just can't be for the paperwork and just find other funding sometimes. So that's how desperate we are. That's really what it boils yeah. down to. If we're at the point to where that's what we have to rely on, uh, then, then we're at a different point. But if you look at the, let's say the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We were brought in to help them fund their 400 miles of fiber and which I think they're just about finishing if they haven't finished it already. And theirs was a mix of a loan. So it was a little bit easier to pick up and operate and they had the capital. So it really depends on the tribe as to how difficult it's going to be for them. Yeah. So you mentioned fiber a few times and of course Cambium were in the wireless world, but mm -hmm. we know, you know, we wireless and fiber work hand in hand, right? It's not one or the other. Usually there's some combination of the two working together to bring connectivity. So how do you decide when when fiber makes sense and when to use wireless, right? To building a band network. Great question. So I would say wireless ends up being the, I would say most of the projects end up two thirds wireless. Fiber is usually just to get a backhaul in. Um, in a perfect world, fiber to the home is fantastic and we all want it. Uh, well, but, you yeah. can't change, <laughs> but you can't change all the wheels on the bus at the same time. And when you have a right. council that are, when some councils are farmers by day, council by night, IT directors are tasked with entire government and broadband infrastructure, anything with the blinky light as well, then suddenly your resources, you know, really come into play. Wireless, you know, it's really what makes it possible from a business standpoint. And when I say a business standpoint, it's not like strictly from a private company business standpoint. I mean, from a community that's trying to help its citizens and neighboring communities. So. I would say wireless becomes, again, about usually about two thirds of the critical infrastructure. Now with this recent educational broadcast spectrum, I can tell you right now, uh, having a clean noise floor uh, in a community and three channels available uh, for uh, 2.5 is has been a beautiful thing. It's a playground when it comes to deploying broadband near line of sight uh, issues. You gotta understand a lot of the tribes we work with are up in the Redwoods. Granite Mountains. I mean, that's that's a wisp's dream. I mean, nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the redwoods uh, can be pretty dense for sure. So. But yeah, the wireless world is is pretty incredible in that. So we work with uh, 80 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, a millimeter wave stuff, and licensed microwave. And um, I mean, we've managed to get one to four gigs and various for backhaul. So. It's not either or. We usually use fiber and wireless to give route diversity to the community that we're serving. And so you mentioned multiple different spectrums just there. So do most of your networks have lots of different flavors of wireless in the same network all working together? Use different wireless <laughs> for different bits? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I would say just I'll give you one example uh, for the Yurok tribes network. We've got 11 gigahertz backhauls. We've got um, on six different tower sites. Uh, we've got 270 degrees of educational broadcast spectrum, five gigahertz, 900 megahertz, and um, a little 365 on one tower. So wow. when you start talking about what is at uh, again, we're trying to solve many problems at once. And to a tribe, those dozen homes are really important. Whereas to a telephone company, they may not be. Um, they may not be able to justify it with their leadership. But um, yes, almost every project has a mix of at least, I would say, three to as much as six uh, different spectrums to kind of solve the problem. Yeah. 
That's great. Wow. It's yeah, it's definitely there's not one size that fits all. Just like there's not, as you said, many there's many problems and there's many ways to solve them. Well, and when you look at the 214 tribes that have successfully completed and some, you know, uh, have received their award letters for the EBS, I don't know what happens after that yet, but um, when you start looking at that, that again is the conversation starter. It's going to solve a big problem for a lot of communities, um, but picture, you know, again, another three to four spectrums being required to truly solve the problem. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So. Um, I am not looking at, Olivia, are there any questions in the chat? I don't actually see it myself. So just making sure as we keep chatting here. Uh, we have one uh, comment so far. Um, I can read that to you. It says uh, CARES Act funding can help with connectivity, but with tight deadlines and spending requirements, it's not optimal to rush and expedite network design. Um, other funding, planning, and coordination is definitely required. Yeah, it sounds like Forrest, do you agree with that? Yes, that's an accurate statement. I would say while CARES funding, we've seen it do some beneficial things, it's yet to be determined how much wreckage there'll be uh, just with little little planning. Fortunately for most of our customers though, we've been in intricately involved in their networks for a lot of years. So it made it a little bit easier to kind of map everything out. Plus we can, we can usually um, assess a community quite quick, a tribe, how their government's structured, what the needs are. So we were able to mitigate a lot of that risk, but yeah, uh, it's not either or. It's in fact, in order of priority, it would be SED's plan for a tribe should include broadband planning. Feasibility study, market study, business plan should be funded through an agency and you should complete that first. Three months worth of work, um, not including your funding time. Then your engineering should have been completed in those studies and then your construction. All of those are usually daisy chained grants or private investment. There are investment groups that look to uh, tribes to partner with for opportunity zones, for data centers, mid to large size solar farms, fiber projects, that type of stuff. So there's a mix for sure. Wow. So aside from the, the funding sources and, and figuring all that out, what, what do you see as the biggest challenges in deploying networks out to the tribal areas? You know, once, once all that paperwork is done, and how do, how do you resolve those usually? Great question. So there's a whole list Top of them. Three. Yeah, I won't, I won't list them all and bore our audience, but um, some of the biggest, so it depends on the perspective. Like I said, InterTribe, uh, we sometimes we're sitting with the state and federal agencies. Most of the time we're sitting with the tribe. Sometimes we're sitting with the WISP or the telephone company. And depending on the perspective, I would say if we were to just start with the VARs and the telephone companies, a lot of times there's misconceptions about how to operate and work with the tribal government. That usually leads to heartache on both sides. Uh, simply understanding how tribes have to operate and how to um, account for that in your planning. Um, so that's one piece. One of the biggest barriers is quite simply culture and communication. Most bars don't realize that they need to be an, an active resource for their tribe. They should be helping with the Tribal Historic Preservation Office work, GIS planning, council meetings, presentations, IT department. And it seems like a heavy lift at first, but speaking from firsthand knowledge, if you, you stick it out, Many of the tribes that we are contracted by, we spent a year just supporting them. I realize we can't always do that, but that's a barrier. Um, I would say some of the barriers for tribes are lack of resources. Um, my brother was the CIO for the, my tribe, the Talawa tribe, for a number of years, and it's really a matter of resources. If you're wearing six hats, your biggest barrier is time. Um, and that, again, yeah. goes back. Providers, you should have more than one tribal liaison from a provider standpoint. You should have a half a dozen truly in each state. Um, if, if you're a state and federal agency, the barrier is the same. Uh, one tribal liaison for the entire state, especially in California, it's not gonna work. Your biggest barrier is resources, time, and knowledge. The other piece on a tribe standpoint is training. So we spend roughly 40% of our time training in deployments and engineering and feasibility. Um, so if you're a VAR, Start training. Um, believe it or not, it actually ends up working for everybody's benefit. And training just means simply exposing uh, whatever departments you're working with to the work that you're doing. Those are just a few. Hopefully, they they weren't too ambiguous. 
No. So, so on the training front, is that training so that the tribe can operate the network once it's put up? Yep. So there's no one size fits all for most of our indigenous communities. Some tribes, it just may not pencil out to become a WISP. They're usually just trying to connect the buildings, the tribal offices, or maybe a HUD development for elder housing. Those are usually those one-off things. But yes, all the above. So for instance, when we represent a telephone company and they're trying to build out infrastructure on, on a reservation lands, we will uh, encourage that board to uh, to have a five-year training plan. For instance, if they're building fiber through the territory, sure, we'll work out an IRU, we'll help you permit it, get it in the ground, the tribe will partner with you on it, but oh, and over the next five years, we'd like you to train on standards and practices for wireless engineering installation, fiber management, and the basics of networking. And it sounds like a lot, but I'm telling you, in the end, everybody's still made whole. Um, I would say, hopefully that answered that. I, I kind of forgot so my does, Who delivers the training? Is Entertribe doing the training? Oh, who, yeah. Who, so, Enter, well, oh, for us, okay. yeah, for us, we, we do a lot of training. We're the guys that bring in the funding, do the training, do the construction. Our goal, so we don't own any, any of the infrastructure that we build, fiber, wireless, otherwise. We build it, and our goal is to work ourselves out of a job. Uh, now, as indigenous communities, we need resources for a considerable amount of time. So that's where I mean you have to really be working as a resource for the community. But there's other things for training. For instance, we'll use Cambium for Cambium training for the gear that we're deploying in a network. And suddenly, we'll start that in the beginning because as we're building the infrastructure, we expose them to the brackets, the GUIs, CN Maestro, CN Archer, and how to manage their point to point links. And we'll do it a half a dozen times. Uh, quite simply, because that's what that's it great. takes if you're wearing six hats. So doesn't that mean, so are you training the the people, some of the people that live in the communities? And does, isn't that also building up their skill sets and b letting them get potential careers beyond even supporting the tribal network over time? Have you seen that? Absolutely. So what you've got, most oh, tribes have so what's cool. called, yeah, they've got what's a tribal employment rights office. So the tarot department, some tribes have, and that focuses on job creation. And what we'll do is link right up with the tarot department immediately. But having grown up on a reservation and seen the lack of resources, understanding that the cultural differences in education are extremely difficult for indigenous communities, or different, I'm sorry, for indigenous communities than they are for not. So right. when you start talking about simply being exposed to a fiber project as a laborer initially we could see that the next step is uh, your bixie certifications for fiber management your rcdd in five years to become a, a fiber engineer our goal is to proliferate things like bixie training bixie certifications wireless training uh, for every single tribe that we work with and i would say that if other vars are working with tribes i would encourage you to to consider doing the same it's a bit of an investment on time, but it's well worth it. Wow, that warms my heart. I love it. So, um, related to that topic, then, what are the what what are the things again? The three things a tribe might need to consider as they plan for supporting the network going forward. How, you know, when they're maintain, you have to. They're going to operate it. So, what are, aside from training, are there any th other things they need to keep in mind? Um, a whole lot of other things, in fact. And again, there's no one answer. Every project, infrastructure project, partnership is like a fingerprint. Um, if they're partnering with a provider, it's important to understand that what the roadmap is and what that means for your citizens. Um, free internet isn't always free internet. Um, then there's somebody's paying. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Or, I mean, yeah, it's, it's in some cases I've seen free internet be likened to trying to drink water through a coffee stirrer. You can do it. It's just going to take a while and you're going to have to spend most of your time doing it. So really understanding what the implications are. For tribes, open access networks are actually a good thing. So bridging that concept with what providers are going for, that's that's a barrier. So I would say from a business or tribal or general council standpoint, it's engagement and then delegation. It's often hard to delegate within our own communities, but making mm -hmm. sure you have a champion. And then community engagement. I have yet to see a project that um, was not successful and a large portion of that was directly attributed to the community's engagement and backing. 
of it. So those are things to think about. Um, I've got a whole list and I'll probably digress, so I'll just leave it there. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so are there any, those were my main questions. I wasn't actually planning to get too much into the technology unless sure. the people on the um, chat wanna, want you to. So is there anything else you think that um, we haven't covered that people want, w might want to think about as they're working on these tribal lands projects that I haven't asked you? Uh, sure, so back to your, your recent question, I'm just looking at your notes here in regards to EBS. So I don't know if anybody got to participate in the First Nations Institute webinar yesterday, but it was about, now you have EBS, what are you gonna do? And I think if you were to just take the educational broadcast spectrum as a bankable asset and, and, and use that to sort of start all the rest of these conversations. If you've partnered with the WISP, by all means, take advantage of that spectrum and find those public-private partnerships. Don't be afraid to partner uh, with groups. But I would say to every council or department head or IT department that's out there that using the EBS sort of as a platform to help raise awareness for your own council, um, could be extremely beneficial. It's not the silver bullet, but it will start the conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. So, Olivia, are there uh, any other questions or comments that we should uh, address? Yes, uh, we have one question for Cambium here. Uh, it says, mm -hmm. being that hundreds of federally recognized tribes may be issued licenses for the 2.5 spectrum, is Cambium planning on offering services to tribes for wireless equipment? Services to tribes. So Cambium is not a service provider, if that's what the question means. We Cambium offers the technology products, you know, the different radios that Forrest talked about um, across a wide range of spectrums. Um, and then the service providers are the WIS or the tribes or what Forrest was um, mentioning. So hopefully that answers the question. I don't know, Forrest, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Well, it's important to understand. I don't know who the question's coming from to know whether what perspective to have, but right. um, it's essentially Cambium works through the channel. So there's value-added resellers like Intertribe that provide products through distribution companies like CTI, like Wave Online, where uh, we get our gear. And it kind of operates that way. And that's really to make sure that the local support for the services um, are actually there uh, because Cambium focuses on technology. We get a large portion of our wireless equipment from Cambium just to, and then we'll work with the distributor sort of on shelving and that might be the root of the question. Hey, are you gonna have enough equipment if every tribe, all 214 asked for it? Oh, okay. That's yeah, cool. and and, um, and where is it at in the development process? Those are the types of questions that I would encourage Cambium to look at because it is dire. I'm, I, we literally have thousands of kids waiting to go to school for us to deploy. We have hundreds of elders unable to do remote medical consultation. So very real question in a very new market. Right, right. So yeah, if the question's about you know availability, as, a, as you said, you can talk to our distributors. They generally have stock and if they don't have it, they can get it. And then, uh, you know, we have a wide, portfolio cover and again multiple different spectrums i would so. also say that it is important to uh, to map that out as early as you can given the pandemic the fires we saw we we encouraged all of our customers tribes to order months three four months in advance uh just because of all these unforeseen things oh forgive me Yes, hopefully we won't have any more disasters. It seems like 2020 was the year of disasters, fires, hurricanes, pandemic, everybody needs connectivity. So um, so with that, I think we'll wrap it up for today. So if you have additional questions, we put on this slide a link to Forest um, Enterprise website, um, two of our distributors, as we mentioned, CTI and WAVE, um, we also, if you're looking at planning, we have a, a fixed wireless planning tool on our website called Link Planner. It's free. Anybody can go out there and check it out if you want to just sort of play around and figure out or uh, think about some ideas. And then we also have a website 
that goes into a little bit more detail about the different offerings we have relative to tribal communities specifically. I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's a great thing that you guys are doing for us. I mean, it, like I said, it warms my heart and I'm glad we can help and participate in getting people connected, getting connections for the first time or getting better connections and helping communities really, you know, improve their situations. That's what it's all about. So we really- well, there's no, no shortage of work to do, so. <laughs> Isn't that the case? Yes, that's true. Okay, well, thank you very much, Forrest. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for those that joined. And again, yep. those that carried the websites if you have any questions. Great. Mary, Olivia, thank you for having us. I really appreciate it. Feel free to reach out with anything.